so good afternoon everyone i take this pleasure and welcome all of you on behalf of vocard medical connect for this very very interesting topic of discussion today telemedicine in india where do we stand and the way forward i think last 60 days has been really tough for the world including india we have gone through what we have never seen in our lifetimes the way things have gone from bad to worse the way we have suffered in the lockdown but if you see the positive side of it we have learned a new way of learning we have learned a new way of living i will say the use of digital technology has uh, skyrocketed everyone is talking about uh, digital technology and on a lighter note the owner of zoom has i think reached the top 100 forbes list so that that speaks about the potential of the digital technology and what comes from a medical aspect is can we use this technology can we use telemedicine in our day to day practice what is the way forward what are the precautions we should take what are the learnings from the past so with uh, that we have two very very senior professionals dr jyoti dev sir who has been practicing uh, telemedicines from uh, almost uh, two decades he is a veteran in that area sir is an uh, endocrinologist from trivandrum and uh, he has published in uh, multiple journals multiple literature he is a editorial board of very very important journals sir is publishing a newsletter regularly and very very active digitally so i think no one in this country is better from a medical front to guide us on this topic and along with dr jyoti dev sir we have a very very senior advocate uh, kapil sankla sir from delhi and again uh, he is a member of supreme court bar association high court bar association and very very active in all kinds of uh, legal uh, matters whether it is civil whether it is criminal and including our medical related things so i think today we are going to get flavor of both the aspects the medical aspects and the legal aspect and i think as a medical person this is what all of us are looking forward to today so with this humble uh, introduction and welcome to both my uh, speakers today dr jyoti dev sir and uh, dr uh, sorry advocate kapil sankla sir let's move ahead with the topic and i know we all have so many questions so we will park those questions for a while let us uh, hear from them and then maybe in the end we will take up some relevant questions so with this i hand over the session to dr jyoti dev sir to begin his talk to you thank you thank you dr rishi jain <clears throat> so now let me share my uh, slides so thank you thank you so much for uh, the nice introduction and for of course for this exciting opportunity along with uh, our advocate kabil sankla and he is a very senior advocate uh, from the supreme court so for all the doctors in india this is uh, going to be a highly fruitful and exciting opportunity so thanks to okar thanks to rishi dr uh, shaku and the team for arranging this program for the doctors in india in the next couple of minutes uh, as instructed to me uh, i'll be briefly going through some of the uh, salient points and uh, this will be mostly sharing from uh, my own personal experience using uh, telemedicine as an aid for treating patients in india from my clinic in trivandrum and uh, the rest of the time i will be spending uh, with the new telemedicine guidelines uh, but of course Uh, the major chunk of it will be discussed later on by our uh, advocate uh, kabir sir so this is how uh, i would like to uh, define and uh, describe this during uh, this uh, uh, testing times telemedicine and pandemics and uh, these are situations which will pose very unique challenges to the community and telemedicine visits can be organized in a hospital in a clinic in an office without exposing uh, our patients without exposing we the doctors and the, the clinical staff to the viruses and infection so we are protected the patients are protected their caregivers are protected and uh, and let me tell you if there is a hospital and if the health systems are invested in telemedicine 
imagine that you are working in a hospital and that that hospital has invested in telemedicine then these are the health systems which are well positioned to ensure that the chronic care patients are taken care of and the covid kind of issues also will receive the care they require and the care they need so it's a highly balancing act when the institution is uh, investing in telemedicine and this is how we all started so this is my a uh, friend joe sitting along with me this is a very very old picture in 1997 and in the background you can see there is a, a old fashioned computer and uh, there is a, a palm pilot over there and you can see the internet connection there is a dial up connection and of course that was a time when we acquired the first uh, asian net operated cable uh, network in kerala and we were discussing about the status of diabetes care i as a doctor and uh, jose as a person with an engineering and a technology background so i was telling him uh, uh, my dear friend i am finding it very difficult to titrate the dose of uh, drugs when i start insulin uh, I, i cannot tell my patients to come back every 3 days and how can i change their behavior so this is a very very threatening situation in india where the average glucose values avnc is more than 10.5 Uh, millions succumbing to the complications of diabetes and ultimately we came up with a solution and this is where it started the diabetes tele management system uh, where uh, we organized a team a multidisciplinary team of physicians dietitians diabetes educators psychologists pharmacists and the patients were reporting their glucose values their behaviors their diet either through the telephone or through the internet or through a secure website and the modifications conveyed back to the patients and this was all to do with individualization so this is the beauty of a technology so with technology we can customize our therapeutic goals and this we started long ago uh, with the telecommunication with the aid of these devices and ensuring uh, compliance with multi drug use diabetes is a disease where unlike many other illnesses we have to have polypharmacy and let me tell you telemedicine when i introduce my doctor friends across india it is a, a specialty but where independent of where you are working it can be gynecology it can be oncology it can be orthopedics any branch can have benefits out of telemedicine consultations another example sharing another experience and uh, this is in the year 2011 when this young girl from Yale University in the United States. She was on a sabbatical with us in Trivandrum, and uh, this is uh, she along with me and uh, our medical director, Dr. Arun Shanga. So she was an observer in two centers run by us, and uh, this is the center where I am now sitting, and this is the center where we were practicing telemedicine. And uh, Rebecca now she is undergoing her endocrinology fellowship training at Boston, and she also worked in 2011 in. another center in trivandrum that you under us where there was no telemedicine where the patients will come directly will get a prescription and will be on a in person follow up and at the end of a month of postings in both the centers this young girl came up with an idea she said uh, uh, dr jodhadev uh, i can see lot of differences in the outcomes when i compare the telemedicine center with the conventional diabetes center so can i perform a study comparing the two centers and i didn't have any objection please go ahead rebecca vitali and this is what she did she presented this at the american diabetes association and she published this paper the two levels of care for diabetes in a developing country where she demonstrated robust differences between the two arms she demonstrated significant differences between the two arms where there is a telemedicine you can see the avnc over there 7.62 compared to 8.58 in the conventional diabetes center ultimately let me tell you my dear friends i shut down the other center now we are only having one center and all the centers we run the telemedicine care yeah. so why could uh, this differences work what could be the uh, reason for these differences these reasons for these differences could be because of the a uh, periodic changes in the 
drug dosage is a highly systematic and structured SMBG program and the adherence to the drugs. Because in diabetes and in many, many lifestyle illnesses, the patients have to be on medications and multiple medications and we need to ensure drug adherence, which is possible with the telemedicine program. And when did it start? Is telemedicine something new? No, telemedicine is not something new. It all started with the invention of telephone by Alexander Graham Bell in 1876. And the first story or a narration behind the telemedicine is getting help from his assistant, Mr. Madsen, after he spilled acid on his trousers. And the documented, the medically documented in a journal, and that is none other than in Lancet in 1879, is a case where overnight the disease of a child was diagnosed by a doctor over the telephone. So this is where it started. For those of you who are curious to find out whether telemedicine is old or new, it all started more than 140, 150 years old. So what is the definition of telemedicine? So this is the WHO definition of telemedicine, delivery of healthcare services, where sometimes distance can be a critical factor, need not be always, by healthcare professionals, using communication technologies for the diagnosis of illness, or the treatment of illness, for prevention of illness, injuries, evaluation, and continuing education of healthcare providers. So what we are performing now, this is also part of telemedicine program. And these are all performed, executed at the interest of advancing the health of individuals and their communities. Telehealth is closely linked to telemedicine. The definition is almost similar, but in my understanding, this also involves the digital platforms, the digital communication technologies, apart from the usual medical care provider and the patient education. So what is telemedicine according to me? And this is the definition I used to in my usual conversations. The simplest will be the use of telecommunications, which can involve an ordinary land form, or I can involve the patient if the patient is having only a basic or a simple inexpensive mobile phone, that is sufficient. But in the case of a person having connected devices at home, in a patient who can afford sophisticated telemedicine devices at home, then of course, that is the other end of the telemedicine practice. So all these comes under the purview of telemedicine. Is it legal in India? Of course, this is legal now in India and we have the legal expert with us and we'll be discussing with him and you can ask all the questions, all the possible questions to our Kavichi. And he is ready to answer to all of our questions. And this is back to our telemedicine program, the DTMS. Whatever be the geographical location of the patient, the study from our center shows that the benefits remain the same. And the role of home blood pressure monitoring. Uh, in this COVID era, in this COVID times, if our patients are having a blood pressure monitoring device at home, then they are very, very fortunate. They can have the blood pressures also measured at home and report to you. It, and this is another study from our center, reporting and documenting, halting the progression of one of the most expensive and devastating diseases of the mankind, that is diabetic kidney disease, where the patients have to be on a lifelong dialysis or a renal replacement therapy which can be probably averted by home blood pressure monitoring and real-time modifications in the medications, the dosages of medications. Another study over 10 years in elderly. Another documentation in one of the most prestigious medical journals that is Diabetes Technology and Therapeutics, where we have 1,000 eligible patients eligible for an A1C lowering of below 6.5, where we have proven that this is a cost-effective technology, telemedicine. When it is combined with a structured and a periodic self-monitoring of blood glucose management, where you reach your targets without the fear of hypoglycemia. So the fear of hypoglycemia 
is the biggest fear in the practice of a doctor. And this fear is the same for the patient as well when we initiate them on therapies, including insulin. So this can be almost completely eliminated with the help of telemedicine. And this is another study over almost two decades in 400 plus patients documenting reduction and prevention of vascular complications. So telemedicine is one of those areas where you can leverage the utility, the technologies for preventing the vascular complications in diabetes. And this is why we are here. So we are here along with the legal expert, Kabilji, and Bokad has arranged this program because on 25th of March, the government of India has introduced the telemedicine practice guidelines. I will briefly go through those areas where the doctor need to be familiar with. So telemedicine consultation should not be anonymous. I should identify myself as a doctor and the patient should also identify himself as a patient. So both has to verify and confirm the identity before the consultation. Number two, there are two types of consultation. It can be a first consultation or it can be a follow-up consultation. So these descriptions are there given for the telemedicine consultation. So first consultation means I'm seeing the patient for the first time. Or I could have seen the patient earlier, but it is uh, beyond six months. Or I'm seeing the same patient within six months, but this time it is with a new disease or with a new symptom. But follow consultation can also be defined if me as a registered medical practitioner doesn't remember the previous context of the consultation. I, I have forgotten. I have not documented because it was an in-person consultation. And then this can be classified into four basic types. And this is dependent on the mode of communication, the timing of consultation, the purpose and the individual is involved. So these are the four major headings. I will only be briefly going through because you need to know only some of the superficial aspects of this, but the inner parts where there is a legal or a litigation possibilities are existing, we will get the opinion, the expert opinion from Kabiji. So according to the mode of consultation, it can be via the video, and that is the ongoing process. It can be via the voice or it can be text-based. So the uh, timing of information can be in real time. So this is the real time communication. I am communicating with you and I can see many of you over there. So we are in real time communication. Or it can be an asynchronous exchange of information. The patient can send me uh, the details of uh, their uh, summary, their discharge card, their investigations, their ECG report through the email or the WhatsApp and I can reply to them when I have time. So I may be replying them uh, at the night or tomorrow. So that is asynchronous exchange of relevant information. And then non-emergency consent, the first consent and the follow-up consent, which we have already discussed. That is according to the purpose of consultation. And according to the individuals which are involved in the consultation, it can be between the patient and the doctor, which is a commonest type. Or it can be with the caregiver of the patient, provided the consent is provided and with the doctor, or it can be the healthcare worker. It can be the pharmacist or the nurse or the uh, educator who is communicating via telemedicine with the doctor. So that's also telemedicine. Or I can get the expert opinion from out of my uh, senior most doctors. So I have a, a question with my patient. So the doctor can have a telemedicine with another doctor. And I think this slide is important for many of my doctor friends who are listening to me. So the telemedicine consultations, uh, the prescribing medications are grouped into uh, the following groups, three groups, and one is the prohibited group. So I have the group O over there, and these are the over-the-counter medications. So over-the-counter means you can prescribe any of these medications. It can be uh, the antacids, it can be the paracetamol, so it can be the pain medication. Whereas the group A medication, it will be those medications which can be prescribed after a video consultation or it can be refilled. So one example will be an ophthalmic cream or a or a uh, something has happened to skin after a consultation. I have decided that I will give a skin cream 
or this can be a superflux as in eye drops, or I can refill the medication for diabetes. For example, if the patient is on insulin, I can refill uh, the prescription, or if the patient is on hypertension, I can refill the same prescription with the same medicine. And group B will be the follow-up medication. These are the add-on medications. So I can add on to the existing prescription, uh, and this can be one more medicine for hypertension, one more medication for diabetes, and so on. The prohibited medications will be those medications which belong to Schedule X of Drug and Cosmetic Act. And these are the narcotic and the psychotropic group of medications which we are not supposed to prescribe. Of course, there was a recent amendment where these medications can be prescribed as a, a refill if the patient is already on these medications. So this is how you can issue a prescription. You are issuing a prescription and you have to take a photo or a scan or a digital copy or the signed prescription and you can email and this can be transferred. If you are providing the prescription to the pharmacy, then you have to take a consent from the patient. So maintain all the records. So this is very similar to uh, the in-person consultations. You know the multiple issues the doctors can confront even after a telemedicine consultation. So the patient records the ECG or the lab reports, the images, the ultrasound scan, everything has to be in the digital copy. It has to be maintained, retained by you and me. And in case the prescription is shared to the patient, maintain the prescription copy also. The records also uh, very similar to the in-person consultation. This is a sample prescription. Uh, this is as uh, published by the Medical Council of India. So you have to you have the name, the full name over there, the registration number, uh, the designation. I repeat, the registration number should be there. And you have to uh, uh, point out you, you, uh, that this is an online consultation, that this is a telemedicine consultation and you have to have either your signature or an e-prescription. So these strengths and limitations of various, various modes of communication, well known to you. The audio consultation, you can simply pick up a phone and then you can call your doctor. And that itself is an implied consent. It is convenient, it is very fast. But the limitation will be the non-verbal cues may be missed and the patient identification needs to be clearer. And if it is a phone consultation, audio alone consultation, there are greater chances of imposters representing the real patient. Uh, the video, I believe, is the most powerful method. It is very similar to an in-person consultation. So it is a very powerful form of a real-time interaction with the patient. But it is dependent on the internet connectivity. If something happens to my internet, then no, everything is gone. So likewise, during a video consultation, for both the ends, you should have a powerful and a reliable internet connectivity. And again, with video consultation, there is a possibility of abuse, misuse, and uh, we will have more discussion on this later on with our legal expert and text-based exchanges, uh, the strengths, it is very quick. It is convenient, but limitations again will be visual and physical touch is lost. And if you really need to examine the patient again, it is difficult because you cannot even see the patient. Identity of the doctor or the patient, you, you are not sure. So some examples of misconduct. One is the RMB is insisting on telemedicine, but my patient is willing and he wants to travel and meet me. RMB is misusing the images and the video clips of the patient after a video consultation. Or I am prescribing those medications from the prohibited list of medications. One more point, which is also considered as a misconduct. If you or me, we are going to start telemedicine, then we cannot advertise. We are not permitted to solicit patients for telemedicine through any advertisements or inducements. Telemedicine, by rule, is not meant for any emergencies. But during this pandemic, of course, you can have a consultation, but you can refer after a first aid or an advice on life saving measure. If you feel as if the patient needs to be referred, you have to refer. And these are the overall uh, question on the game because so many doctors usually ask me, do I have to take up a course or not? 
Like now we don't have a online course, but soon there will be a mandatory online course where the Medical Council of India uh, will instruct all of us to get trained for telemedicine consultations. But during the interim period, the principles that is mentioned in these guidelines that we are discussing need to be followed. But once the online course is published, then we need to get trained and then only we can prescribe. So complete a mandatory course within three years of its notification. Some examples of how we can transmit the images. So this is from the Apple Watch from one of, one of my patients. So this is how I could give my advice within one or two minutes of receiving the ECG. An example of connected glucose meters, many are available and some of these are very accurate and the patients can transmit via email or via WhatsApp a blood glucose diary in the form of a PDF or a blood glucose report in the form of a PDF or raw data file as a CSV file. And these are again color coded for the time in range, the time below range and time above range. Another example of connected glucose meters where the entire dashboard of all these patients are visible in my consultation room. And the moment the patients are measuring their glucose values in the glucometer, I can also see, or my nurse or my diabetes educator can also see them. And then over a period of six months or two weeks or one year, the data, the graph, the pattern, everything. And that too, without any extra cost for the patient. And these are all available totally free of cost. Another example of remote glucose monitoring, and this is with the, the new uh, DS3 device, and this is how this can be displayed. So the patient is at a distance, and the remote monitoring device is providing me with the data on uh, the Apple Watch, providing me an SMS alert, high predicted. And once the high is predicted as seen over the screen, the glucoses are going to be high, and this alert has reached me half an hour before. Half an hour before, a hypo or a hyper. And the same can be seen in the browser in any phone. And this is two arrows pointing upwards. One arrow will denote glucose is increasing or uh, getting reduced by one milligrams per deciliter per minute. So these are all examples of remote monitoring and examples of informed decision making. So the team can immediately get back to the patients with what they are supposed to and what they are not supposed to. Let me now have one slide on using third-party applications. So, so many doctors are now using uh, the third-party platforms for tele uh, com communications and for tele consultations. And these are widely propagated nowadays, but a word of caution. When you're using artificial intelligence or machine learning capable uh, applications, please remember, Many of these apps can provide some advices on even modifications of dosages, counseling. But as per the Medical Council of India, the final prescription and counseling need to be directly delivered only by the registered medical practitioner. And the technology platform should also ensure that there is a proper mechanism in place to address any questions or grievances at the that the end customer can have. So at the end of the consultation, if there are any questions or if there are any grievances, the third party or the technology platform should have a mechanism in place. So you should also remember when we are conducting the telemedicine consultation. So what about the teleconsultation fees? Of course, this is again similar to a consultation in our clinic. You should be treated in the same way. We can receive the consultation fee, but remember, you have to provide a receipt or an invoice for the fee charge for providing telemedicine consultation. So this is uh, one of those platforms that we are using in our center, dtmsonline.in, where there is a secure uh, payment pathway as well. And uh, we have in 2015 published this paper on the feasibility and sustainability and efficacy of a telemedicine program for over 15 years. And this free full text article has actually enabled many app developers because we have openly, we have discussed in this article all the merits and demerits of a telemedicine program. So telemedicine has got a plethora of benefits, but at the same time, there are multiple challenges. So we have discussed everything in detail in this particular article. But remember, 
Some of these areas we need to be careful. Miscommunication, dosage errors, which can happen during a voice or video consultation. So somebody has fixed up an appointment with you at six o'clock in the evening for telemedicine consultation, and if you are not available, you have to have a mechanism in place. Accidents and emergencies. Telemedicine is primarily not meant for that. Lone elderly at home, those elderly people living alone at home, be very cautious communicating, especially dosages of medications and other counseling. And if you are providing education via Your screen has got lost. Yeah, yeah. So am I back? We can see you, not the screen, sir. Okay, okay. So let me... Let... I have to share. This because of the internet connectivity only. But luckily we are at the end of this lecture. Only two more slides to go. <laughs> yeah, we can see now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, and another area is uh, when you have only 10 or 20 patients at the beginning for telemedicine, and when the numbers are growing, uh, when we are using these digital platforms for telemedicine consultation, be prepared for that, because this can be really challenging when the numbers are huge. Of course, it is exciting, it is exciting. So this is my concluding slide. So however much the technologies have advanced and technology is still advancing, but we doctors, of course, the lawyers will also believe in the same principle, the sustainability of any program, including these consultations and our chronically ill patients, the sustainability ultimately will depend on real time live conversation. So telemedicine, of course, is going to stay with us after, even after the COVID crisis, but in-person consultations are also indispensable. So this is a, a snapshot from our, uh, from our monthly diabetes journal. We have been publishing this journal for more than 12 years now. And this is the 130th journal where we have also highlighted that we are online since 23 years. So thank you. Thank you so much, Vukad, uh, and thank you all my doctor friends uh, for this opportunity and for the uh, patient hearing. We'll be back again after the questions. Now, uh, back to Dr. Rishi. Thank you. Thank you sir. Thanks for that uh, informative uh, talk. And uh, we'll take the question answers later on, sir. So we'll move to Advocate Kapil Sankla, sir, to please share his opinion on the topic. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jain. Thank you, Vukad, for this wonderful opportunity. Am I audible? I hope uh, my voice is clear. Yes, sir. It is good, sir. Fantastic. And uh, Dr. Jyoti Dev has very eloquently explained the nuances of telemedicine. I think he's explained it more beautifully than I could. But uh, as a litigation lawyer with more than two decades practice, where we've been representing uh, doctors and hospitals and uh, insurance companies especially, and have running a law firm where we give corporate consultancy services, ensuring that uh, mall practices suits are reduced. Uh, I would be explaining the guidelines as from a litigator's point of view to avoid litigation and to make sure that uh, to understand the legal perspective of these guidelines uh, on the basis of uh, judgments and precedents of the Honorable Supreme Court and NCDRC, as well as rely on uh, some of the judgments of international uh, de developed countries where telemedicine is already quite established. You see that in 2018, the judgment of the Honorable Mumbai High Court created uh, questions as to the legitimacy of telemedicine, as they said that there were no proper guidelines in place. Now, these guidelines have laid down this uncertainty to rest. And uh, 
they are quite comprehensive in itself once you read the guidelines i think most of the queries automatically get satisfied despite its timing as uh, these have been brought in to provide better uh, to ease medical care during covid 19 the purpose and preamble of this guideline is very important as a litigation lawyer the first thing we see is what is the preamble that is called the source of an act or the soul of an act which is something very important and you need to understand so the preamble or purpose as enumerated is enabling healthcare access one especially in those cases where there is no need for in person consultation secondly is making healthcare more affordable and thirdly is creating better system of record management through increasing the legal protection for both the parties so these three are very very important and you have to keep them as their guiding spirit of the guidelines itself so in case of doubt you can always refer to these three principles as laid down in the guideline these guidelines will have far reaching consequences and positive impact in the healthcare system given that we are one of the largest key one of the key players in uh, international medical tourism although this guideline specifically prohibits two very important things one it explicitly excludes consultation outside the jurisdiction of india which is very important secondly it says that an rpm is entitled to provide telemedicine consultation to patients from many parts of india so please remember you have to be in india the patient has to be in india if anybody is out of india it is beyond the territorial jurisdiction there might be some way about it but as on now the guidelines are very very specific it is only for the territory of india not beyond the issues that concern us from legal perspective are these one understanding the guidelines as i said that these are quite comprehensive second understanding data laws because unfortunately the guidelines really do not talk about the software the hardware that can be used and how data is going to be stored when this is the most important thing that had to be taken into consideration considering telemedicine is it is in its nascent stage in india and there are already problems that have in internationally where people have faced as far as uh, data the information technology act crpc criminal law and brief because this is where uh, the data laws are found uh, we will also understand the key concepts like negligence malpractices onus of liability uh, under consumer law under civil law which is called the law of tort and under criminal law to give you a mantra on how a lawyer looks at this it is very very simple a mere negligence does not amount to a civil wrong you have to show gross neg negligence to bring a claim under the ambit of civil law or consumer law and you have to show rash negligence and recklessness to bring a complaint under the ambit of criminal law without which no civil case or criminal case can be made up and onus is very heavy on the person who is making such a complaint we have already dealt with who can practice telemedicine we will not go there but to come to come straight away the law of consultancy when it comes to doctors has had been laid has been laid down by the honorable supreme court way back this was laid by laid down in a judgment called the lakshman balkrishna uh, joshi matter this was landmark because the honorable supreme court laid down the guidelines which would guide any doctor giving consultancy and these guidelines were duty to care so it said that the doctor has a duty of care in deciding whether to undertake a case or not which means that a doctor can decide not to take a case the second was duty of care in deciding what treatment to give which is also what these guidelines talk about that it is the right of the doctor to decide the nature of the treatment third very importantly it is duty of care for the doctor while administration of that treatment so there could be a case where you have given an advice to a patient the patient refuses for example you're referring him to another doctor or for further test and he refuses it is your duty of care to put it down in black and white to document that fact so that your onus is removed remember this data is king in cases like these there it is also king when a consumer case or a malpractice case is filed now breach of this breach of any of these duties can only give rise to a cause of action for negligence suit breach of duty may be occasioned by and this is what the supreme court has said and i'm going to quote it either not doing something which a reasonable man 
under a given set of circumstances would do or by doing some act which a reasonably prudent man will not do so that is the test to see whether a case would come under a case of negligence or not as i said the onus is extremely heavy on the complainant it is not like the honorable supreme court in various judgments have come in aid of doctors and said that mere mere negligence mere lack of knowledge or if what the doctor has stated has not come to be does not create a case against the doctor uh, dr jyoti dev has already told you that there are three processes to initiate a telemedicine practice one is video audio or text based but i'll quickly make you understand that this can be done by mere telephone call it can be done by internet calling it can be done by face time whatsapp any of these regular uh, uh, devices and systems that we are already using or you could take proprietary systems software which have been specially created to help uh, and manage telemedicine practice now this would create its own uh, different set of uh, problems and liabilities when it comes to data management which we will briefly touch because this guidelines do not really deal as i said with how and what kind of hardware can be used how and what kind of software can be used how will the data be stored etc but very importantly as i said that any instructions advice any consultancy can be given only in the jurisdiction of india and when you are in the jurisdiction of india and it cannot be used for conducting any surgical or invasive procedure remotely having said that the liability of an rmp is very limited he only has the duty to care what a prudent person would do when it comes to management and storage of data but he has the responsibility of being aware of the data protection and privacy law so this disparity or this disconnect would be met subsequently the technical working committee which is the technical working group for telemedicine standardization department of it has recommended guidelines as security stressing need for ensuring a unique identifier for the patient rmp and service provider what could probably be done at this time is that you could be an early adopter of such a such a system i which we mentioned in the the description you could give that could be standardized for future reference between the rpps as well uh, now coming to briefly touching the technology platform because that is going to be a big thing with uh, iot with the uh, internet of things with artificial intelligence and with all these algorithms that have now come to into play the responsibility would always be of the technology provider to ensure that there is a valid interaction between the patient and the doctor and the doctor is duly registered which is a requirement it would have to take into consideration that it has done its due diligence that the doctor is duly registered that there are no cases against the doctor there is no encumbrance secondly very importantly an artificial intelligent unit a software a device an algorithm or an internet of thing a software on an app can be used but it can only be used to aid and assist an rmp it cannot be given used to give medicine or to give counseling to the patient in such a case if a complaint is made that app the service provider will be blacklisted and there could be other uh, consequences as well under criminal law now a question is there whether a slip or a prescription given by a doctor is valid or not this you will have to go to the it information technology act which under section 4 and 5 states that it gives a legal recognition to an electronic record as well as to a digital signature therefore a prescription or an advice given by you transmitted through an electronic means duly having your digital signature would be a valid document for all causes and all purposes it will be honored by all departments by the chemist as well as by insurance companies quickly touching up about insurance companies as i said that it would be a valid document for insurance company however medical practice to telemedicine is supposed to be a high risk business in america and other developed countries and therefore has a higher risk of a higher medical liability premium you should be aware of this because in future as more and more people adopt it and it becomes more adaptable there could be issues pertaining to that there are certain tests and important points that you need to take into consideration the test is whether you are using your best judgment or not that is all remember this 
use of best judgment is the test in all cases pertaining to telemedicine second that in all cases the same professional and ethical uh, norms as well uh, will be will be uh, followed as are followed in in person consultation and care so when in doubt always say always ask yourself what would i do if it was an in person consultation you would usually have the answer it is a very easier way of finding the way forward for an act which is or a guideline which is at its nascent stage uh, as dr jyoti rao said that in emergency uh, emergency care should be avoided uh, what you can do is provide first aid give life saving measures counseling and referring and always advise the patient on the face that he should go for an in person interaction the professional discretion is always there of the rmp and only of the rmp to gather whatever information he thinks is required in case such information is not coming he can end the consultation so the law or the guideline very clearly say at any stage of the consultation either the patient or the doctor can disconnect the patient uh, and doctor relationship and disconnect the call or communication you too can end the communication if you are not getting the answers that you want from the patient advising him to either come for an in person consultation or to go to an in person consultation because you fear that he is not being forthright and not giving you the complete details documents that are required for you to come to a, a legally viable a, a doctor's prescription or an advice so the requirement to reiterate is what is requirement is reasonable amount of care and knowledge this guideline was settled by another supreme court judgment a very very important judgment for you which is called the J J jacob matthew judgment where the honorable supreme court said what is the test of negligence when do you see that a doctor has not done his duty it said that whether reasonable amount of care and knowledge you cannot be an expert in your field you are practicing you are learning medicine every day it clearly stated that every case could be different no two people will respond to the same medication or same care so whether you were reasonable or not is what the test is and not the what the end result is the other guiding principles is that you may refuse to give advice refuse to uh, take the call you may ask for this and you may even refer which was not per permitted before but this also allows you to refer the case and the medication that will be given would be in terms of what the guidelines already say one important thing that you need to take care of is which is again a, a disconnect in the with the entire guideline itself is that an rmp cannot insist on telemedicine when the patient insists that he is able and willing to come for an in person consultation so this connect this disconnect probably will be met in future but at this moment i think why this is put, being put in is because there is a fear that this could be corporatized and probably there would be only apps etc giving run of the mill instructions and help etc uh, now the process to be followed have also been discussed beforehand but i will only speak about the legal parameters of it because there are a lot of queries that i see and i can probably answer them here itself the protocol that you are supposed to follow is first self identification when you self identify yourself you should be very clear and give your name qualification identification and registration number i would advise you to make an e card that can be transmitted to the patient the moment there is an initiation of a call to make it as your display picture so that it is there and to put it in every communication that you are making so that there is no question whether the rmp was himself or there were there was somebody else and also to put your photograph that would be the best course to follow under the circumstances likewise the second most important thing to do is to have patient identification now this is very important because there are a number of cases which have been which have come under the ambit of negligence where in prior occasions on telecalls the doctor did not actually find out who the patient was or when the patient was a minor and there was no major who had given permission in patient identification i would suggest that you take the name that you take the photograph email etc and at the first initiation you take a registered uh, phone number or a registered email on which you will communicate so that subsequent communications can be faster without having to go back and trying to find about the entire identity of the patient itself uh, an important thing is about 
implied consent and express consent because a patient doctor relationship is bound by contract law and can only uh, come into place where there is clear client clear uh, patient and doctor relationship and for which there has to be consent now imagine you're sitting in your uh, hospital or your clinic and a doc and a patient comes to you the consent is implied by the fact that he has come to your hospital likewise when a patient initiates a call it is an implied consent that he he has initiated uh, the the patient uh, doctor relationship i would suggest that you go a little ahead at this stage i think it is much better that you initiate conversation about your fee structure which the guideline clearly say that you are entitled to ask for fees because also once the fee is transferred from the patient's account to your account the patient doctor relationship is implicit in that transfer itself there can be no question later that there was no relationship between both the parties as far as express consent is con consent is concerned it could be a standardized thing that i such and such give my consent to such and such it could also be in cases where the patient is not contacting you directly he is contacting you through a healthcare professional or through a third party which has been also put down in the guideline now before you give the type of consultation it is important and imperative and because this is been put in the guideline is that you ask the patient to give all previous prescription all previous medication that he was having including self medication and any doctor advice if any and i would suggest that you if you are on a video call and of course it is being recorded great if not then at that moment there could be some kind of documentation that is created so that you have with you all these details and if the patient claims that there are no such details it has to be well documented by you otherwise it might create some kind of legal wrangle on later day uh, after after this of course we have the type of uh, consultation we have patient evaluation it could be by various modes as we've already discussed audio video or uh, text mode uh, when we have patient evaluation you end the call with either prescribing a medication i or asking him for further test or medical advice or referral we will not uh, uh, discuss this any further except for the fact that at any case the diagnosis will be dependent on your best ability to judge at that time so at that time the standard of care is very heavy and you have to actually decide whether you should be giving some kind of these kind of medicines or not. i would advise you to annex your one of the guidelines that gives a chart on the kind of medicines that you can give and under which circumstances a question is whether antibiotics can be given so remember this again that if a patient comes to you and you think antibiotics are required at that stage antibiotics can be given at that stage uh, however please read the chart itself to see whether any specific medicines cannot come or do not come under the uh, under list a and come under list b etc because your medication or your uh, diagnosis or uh, what you are prescribing would be dependent on that very very important when you give your prescription there has to be an express consent if the medication if the prescription is being given to a third party for example a chemist etc there has to be an express consent otherwise you cannot disclose if the prescription is being sent to the patient itself then there is no difficulty however you cannot right now afford to have the famous doctor scroll you have to give proper uh, prescription which is duly legible and probably with more details because that document would be evidence for days to come and can actually be used in evidence uh, as i've already stated that you can refuse consultation in any kind and so can the patient so we will not go there i will end it up very quickly by talking about technology and privacy laws because this is something that is going to uh, be of much import in the coming years you have to maintain all records which could be screenshot which could be logs which could be prescriptions the period has not been prescribed uh, in the guidelines i think they will come up with the, these uh, further guidelines but under civil law the the, the period of limitation is 3 years so i would advise you that all of these details are stored for a period of 3 years it is also there in the regulations of 2002 that uh, certain uh, that uh, the data the details have to be maintained by doctors for a period of 3 years so we will go we will take that as our guiding principle right now uh, 
you will be bound by all times by medical the principles of medical ethics and other governing principles you will abide by the indian medical council professional conduct etiquette and ethics regulation 2002 and all relevant provisions of it act data protection and privacy laws will be applicable upon you having said that your degree of care will be reasonable degree of care you cannot be expected to be a computer expert now the code of medical ethics prescribed uh, prescribed by mci require that you do not disclose any secret of patient under any circumstances unless under orders of the court however there are certain exceptions on confidentiality way back in 1998 there was a landmark judgment which was mr x versus hospital z a very interesting judgment where the doctor or the hospital disclosed the hiv positive result of the patient to the fiance and this created a litigation the honorable supreme court stated that it was important for the respondent the hospital in this case to disclose information for the benefit of society therefore in certain cases where disclosure can be done with emphasis on article 19 and 21 of the constitution of india so this was an exception uh, in 2000 In 2020, NCDRC reiterated the law regarding ownership of medical documents because the patient can ask, demand that we hand over all the documents that you have, and the law to that has already been number of judgments notified. But in 2020, it was reiterated by NCDRC that the record keeping has been addressed by Medical Council of India Regulation 2002, which is that you have to maintain record for four months for three years. Which is in section one point three point one. You have to request. Are your voice is cracking? Is it better now? Yeah, this is little better. I am surprised. I am sorry, but I was coming to the end of it. Uh, it says that request for medical record by patient has to be honoured within seventy two hours. Still, it is cracking only so. Yeah, is it better now? Yes, sir. Let's start. Okay, and uh, the last was an advice that please digitize all records which is being done in this case. Is there any question? I would be more than happy to answer that. I think I have many questions that have been asked till now as well. <clears throat> so your video has hanged. I think. now it's video is fine but voice was cracking okay is it better yes sir hmm. so uh, thank you sir for a very very informative uh, legally informative talk and we have lots of questions pouring in so but just to summarize so right now telemedicine is legal as per yes. the guidelines which were recently issued and definitely doctors can uh, pursue telemedicine and they can even charge their patients absolutely so yes. is there a cap on the amount which they can charge a patient or it is depending on the doctor's uh, uh, wish what amount he should charge to the patient see it is it is absolutely dependent on the doctor's wish as i said that the test is what he would charge where there would be an in person consultation so Please. there is no capping whatsoever so the question and uh, there was a very recently a viral news uh, i think somewhere in punjab a doctor a pediatrician in amritsar has asked to pay the patient's family to pay money for a consultation and it was blown up some politicians also poured in and the commissioner uh, deputy commissioner of police a complaint was raised so yes. what are the legal options for a physician at such a stage this question has been raised by dr nishit chandra and of many other people i have also raised a similar question so what are the legal right. options lies with a physician at such stage see the legal options are very very clear as far as that fir is concerned that fir was wrongly registered it is most unfortunate it is misuse of the system uh, but the doctor should also have followed certain protocols i think i've i've uh, heard the communication it was something where the wife picked up the phone and uh, it kind of spiraled down from there i think the system should have come into place uh, the fir has been uh, wrongly registered and i think action should be taken against the police officers for registering a false fir okay uh, so uh, coming to this uh, uh, so now we can see both the old patient as well as new patients and the law is only for the patients which are in india 
but because of right. covid recently lot of patients are stuck outside india although they are originally indians maybe they are old patient of few of these doctors but right now they may be stuck in dubai or xyz so if these yes. patients want to consult their doctors so how legal is that consultation so as far as guidelines it is not legal but also understand that the guidelines also permit a caregiver to speak on behalf of the patient and the caregiver being in india and there being an express consent however the test would be can a doctor in sitting in india take care of a patient who is not in india if the answer to that is no in the negative then the answer in guidelines is also no okay Okay. So my question is, uh, the doctor, if if I am in uh, uh, India and if my patient who is getting my prescription, my medicines from me, he is in uh, Middle East in Dubai, right. oh, and right. uh, the wife is in India, but the consultation is between the doctor and the patient, because right. patient right. has to consult with me via video from uh, say Dubai. Right. So can right. it be done if uh, I am having the consent from the caretaker in India? So is it legal so that I communicate with the caretaker afterwards, or if three are there in the video along with the wife, if I am seeing the patient, so how right. can it be, be legalized? So the guidelines do not permit you, mm. as I said, but the guidelines also mm. seem to show a way, saying that once there is an express consent from the patient, that the caregiver can take forward the consultation. Then any advice mm. given to the caregiver. would also be applicable upon the patient itself but again as i said the issue here would arise whether the patient who is not in india can actually be given medical care from india or whether a doctor sitting in usa can give medical care to a person sitting in india when a doctor is not registered with mci so the answer it is a very circuitous route you know going through gray area but that seems to be the only way under this circumstance so lots of uh, patients are contacting doctors on whatsapp and it's a right. just a chat it is not a communication on the phone it's just a chat and even doctors are prescribing sometimes on a uh, chat of whatsapp so one is does it qualify for tele consultation can they charge the patient and uh, how official is that uh, prescription which is just given on a whatsapp so the doctor have to register that any advice given to any patient by whatsapp or any other means mean even informally has legal consequences under the guidelines so no chat should be taken to be frivolous to charge or not to charge is the absolute discretion of the doctor but any communication given has a legally binding contract between a doctor and patient and will be dealt with in the guidelines accordingly so even even a chat like that initiated by the patient or the doctor has to come under the parameters and pass the requirements of the guideline okay okay so even if it is not charged there will be legal consequences if there is a medical discussion happened and a prescription has been offered so the supreme court in a landmark judgment had stated in what cases medical negligence will follow or a relationship between patient doctor will follow and stated that in case where the patient is not being charged because he does cannot pay because the doctor is not charging etc etc so there were various parameters so while they excluded from the ambit of consumer court you know doctors working in uh, government hospitals etc etc but they said that the liability under civil law will still exist the liability under criminal law will still exist and even where you are not charging but the patient is capable pay your liability will still survive so the liability is there and therefore you should not act accordingly sir in in a digital communication whether it is a telephonic or a video there are high chances that the communication can be recorded by the patient so yes. does it act as a piece of strong evidence in court of law it is an acceptable piece of evidence that communication recording so the onus is on the doctor himself to record all communication because this is what the guidelines say So if the doctor, if the lawyer, if, sorry, if the patient is also recording it, there is nothing amiss. It can be used. In fact, there are a number of judgments of the Supreme Court that has laid very strict onus on the doctor on recording uh, and keeping the record safe in case of a doctor-patient relationship. There is there is a wonderful uh, uh, a landmark judgment 
where the NCDRC, this was in 2016, this was uh, uh, Lok Nayak uh, Hospital versus uh, KM Santosh, where compensation was given because the hospital did not take the care of bringing forth the record, the medical record. And in another case of Indu Sharma versus Apollo Hospital, the court held that a, pay, a person may lie, but the documents will speak the truth. And therefore, there is very heavy onus on the doc hospital to keep those records. It is more so in these guidelines. So sometimes the physical visits may be one minute, two minutes or 30 minutes, depending on the type of doctor. But uh, what about digital uh, kind of a telemedicine kind of a consultation? Do doctors have to have a predefined time limit that every patient will be given 10 minutes or 5 minutes or there is nothing like that? Or should they monitor that? How much was the time spent when the patient came in or what when the discussion started and when the discussion ended? So do they need to document how much time the overall interaction lasted? You see, when you're documenting the entire communication and keeping snapshots of it, the time is automatically documented because you cannot tamper with this is material evidence under the evidence act having said that the test is the same what would be the time limit for a consultation in an in-person consultation if a doctor because of his expertise can diagnose a patient in 60 seconds so be it it is also chargeable if he takes six hours it is also chargeable accordingly so it is exactly the, the way an in-person consultation will be given Yeah. So there is a question from Dr. Jain. So he says he signs, he makes a prescription on his letterhead, signs it and just take a photograph and send it on WhatsApp. So is that the right way of doing things? Can he do something like that? He can, of course, do that, but he has to ensure that his writing is legible and there is nothing amiss. Because now the owners, as I said, data is key. So whatever information you have to give has to be crystal clear. There is now no chance of any ambiguity or confusion because then they would, the liability would be that the patient or the chemist is, is contacting you again and again for better, uh, uh, you know, better writing or better details, etc., which would be initiating the entire test in terms of the guidelines once again. There is a prescription format which is uh, published by the Medical Council of India where you have to have all the details of the uh, doctor, you have to have the registration number. Uh, and uh, the prescription can be transferred via the WhatsApp or the email. But subsequent to the consultation, if the patient is asking for one more symptom, uh, can be uh, SMS or WhatsApp that medicine name alone via text message without a prescription? Is it legal or not? Dr. Sir, you only answered this question when you were describing what is uh, first consultation and uh, what is follow-up consultation. So the concept of first consultation is if he's contacting you for the first time, or if he is contacting you for a new health con condition, even after he is initiated conversation and that conversation is ended regarding one medical condition, if mm -hmm. he wants to discuss another medical condition, it is the first consultation vis-a-vis -vis that fresh condition. So the so I have, so I have to make a uh, new prescription. So that consultation new prescription. It oh. is much better to make fresh because otherwise there would be a disparity as to what kind of medication you can give under list A or list B. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, it is always better to then start another consultation for a fresh cause of action, so to say, or a fresh medical condition. Dr. Jyoti Dev, sir, you had been practicing telemedicine for uh, almost two decades now. What are the practical, key practical challenges you have faced in this practice? So, what messages or what uh, word of caution you would like to give to the audience, which has uh, recently started uh, telemedicine? Uh, number one will be the duration of the consultation, which we were just discussing. Because when we are uh, having the teleconsultations, especially with the elderly patients, known to you, it can be a review visit. So it can go for hours together. So we have to have some idea about the duration of a teleconsultation, which will go beyond the discussion of illnesses, symptoms, and medications. Uh, especially if you have a good connect with the patient. And then the second is the errors which can happen. Because in uh, diabetes, what we do is uh, we need to find out the dosages of medications which is existing for the patient. And then only we will modify the uh, medication dosages based on the behaviors and the sugars. So this is to uh, confirm that the patient is on the same dose of the medication or not. So if the patient is on Consegna, for example, 
four units and uh, six units in the evening. He may be on a different dose of the medication, but in the system, it will be a different uh, dosage. So I need to make sure before I am changing the medication. This is something which is a big challenge. And then I will say, uh, Dr. Rishi, making a payment for the telemedicine consultations used to be a challenge for us over the last uh, more than 23 years. Because patients believe that uh, when somebody is calling over the phone or when we are, they are having a consultation, earlier days we used to have consultation with the Yahoo Messenger, when the video was available, Yahoo Messenger. Yahoo Messenger is no longer available. So during those consultations, I still remember many patients have a belief that this is something like a casual conversation with the doctor and they need not pay for the consultation. So this, this is something which is going to uh, be a challenge for many doctors because telemedicine alone we need to follow for many of our patients in the coming weeks or coming months. And the third is uh, the relative at home or the uh, other doctor who is also consulting the same patient. Some communication errors can happen because the patient will be sitting at home, not traveling to the hospital. Then the major uh, challenge is with the uh, medication when it is transferred to the pharmacy. Because when the hospital, the patients will get the same medicine which is prescribed by the doctor. But there are more chances of substitution and they might get some other medication which you have prescribed. So that is also a big challenge when they are going to the pharmacies around. So this is in brief, but we have given all the details in that Ruby paper. Sure, sure, Sir, there is a question that uh, there are lots of third party applications which are available and, uh, and there are portals like WhatsApp and things like that. So which is legally more safe? Are the third party applications or liability or the owners legally lies uh, on the individual physician is less in which one or which is legally more safe? So under the Information Technology Act, the act actually says that it recognizes three parties. One is the one who has initiated uh, a communication under the IT Act. The second is the recipient. And the third is the person who is in between the intermediary. If there is an intermediary, then, this, then the contract between the doctor and the patient is also between the inter-doctor but then you have to be careful about what kind of contract you enter between with, with the third party provider. I think the sound is breaking. Uh, so uh, uh, let, let me also add on to this. When we are using a, a third party technology platform, because this is a question which many, many doctors are currently asking us whether I can use this platform or the other platform. So I would say that you, you should be using the platform of somebody if you would really like to use it, which is existing for quite some time. It should be a time-tested platform because many of these startups, they will be there with us for two years or three years and suddenly they will vanish. So that shouldn't happen since the data need to be very secure. And I would say that since the social media platforms, including WhatsApp, Zoom, all of them are now legalized, we can still use it. And uh, because uh, what I do is I will use uh, my own platforms. And if the patient is very familiar with Zoom, then I will go with Zoom. If the patient is only familiar with the WhatsApp video, then I will ask them to use WhatsApp video. And then similar to what we have done, I will share the electronic medical records from our desktop screen with them. So I can show the graphs of how the BP has changed over the years, how the A1C has changed over the years. So it is more like an experience uh, which is better than visiting me personally. So at the comfort of their house, in the laptop or the phone, they can see all the results, lab results, the graphs, the prescription, everything. So they really enjoy. So, uh, and I make sure that there is no data security leakage. Everything is very secure because uh, the data is stored only with me and not shared with any platform. Sir, uh, is it mandatory for the physician to record all the conversations? If he's doing a video call or audio call, is it mandatory? that they should record and store all the communication because most of us are doing casual conversations. We are recording, we are taking money via Paytm or, a, but there is no digital recording or a digital saving of all the communication. So how mandatory is that? So the guidelines very clearly stipulate that you have to take screenshots and that you have to take an entire 
data, which means the recording being a part of data under the IT Act, you have to record the conversation for future use uh, in case of any dispute. Correct. And how about prescription of uh, scheduled drugs? So there are lots of narcotics, there are lots of restricted drugs. Can they be prescribed over telemedicine? Dr. Jyoti Dev has already answered that, that that cannot be prescribed. There is a list given. Uh, yes. Schedule X drug cannot be prescribed. Narcotics cannot be described. Psychotropic drugs cannot be prescribed at all under this. Very true. So they cannot be prescribed. Right. And this is one question because with Kabirji answer I was discussing yesterday. Uh, there was one amendment which came up, uh, I think, last week or so, where it is written, where is that amendment? Uh, there it is uh, stated that somebody who is on phenobarbitone for epilepsy, somebody who is on uh, uh, three or four similar drugs are there, which are on anti-epileptic drugs, anti-psychotics, and if it is a refill, it can be prescribed. But that is a gray area, because they may be meeting some other doctor, and uh, we don't know whether the patient is already on this prescription or not. Right. So, uh, How about antibiotics, antibiotics, sir? Antibiotics, antibiotics can be prescribed. Antibiotics can be prescribed. What about you know? injectables like insulins and all? Can you so prescribe? Insulin injection, insulin injection can be prescribed uh, provided the consultation is between a doctor and another doctor or a nurse is there to go there and help with the patient. Uh, or if the patient is already on a basal insulin, yes. then I can prescribe a regular insulin uh, because the patient is already familiar with the use of insulin. It becomes an add-on to the existing injection. But the gray area which I would like to get some clarity from our Kabilji is on prescription of this. Sir, your video is not clear. Can you repeat the question? I think there is some network issue. Uh, tell that I have a question for a couple, sir. Sir, do we need to identify the prescription, whether it was an e-prescription? So on the letterhead, if we are prescribing, should we write it that it is a tele-prescription or a digital prescription? Yes, so format has been given in the guidelines itself. Yes, I sir. would suggest to use that as your template in all circumstances. But most of the doctors are using their own letterheads and what they are doing, they are prescribing on the letterhead and probably scanning it and sending it. And most of the details of the doctor's identification, the registration number are usually there on that letterhead. And then uh, they are just sending, signing it and sending it off. Yes, but I, my advice to you was that it would also be appropriate to have your photograph on it so that tomorrow there cannot be a dispute that the said doctor was not there and the prescription was given by somebody else or that, you know, there was a software because what is now going to happen is a lot of these apps would probably hire doctors and it could become more of, of the turnover gate. So in such circumstances also, it is better that the prescription is not only signed, digital signed, but also as the photograph of the doctor giving that prescription. So most of the time consultation is an implied, uh, sorry, consent is an implied consent when the doctor has been approached by a patient, it is an implied, whether it yes. is tele or digital. But uh, yes. is, is in any specific case you want that we should record a consent, that yes, a consent has to be recorded to be safe. Is there any special circumstances where we should record a consent and we should take a informed consent rather than an implied consent? Well, one simple thing is where there is a minor involved. Secondly, where there is a caregiver or a third party or an RMP, another RMP involved. In such cases, there has to be express consent. Thirdly, when you are giving a prescription and uh, you are sending it to a chemist, there has to be an express consent involved. So my, my advice to you as a lawyer is that you do all of this and importantly also do the transaction before you go for uh, advising the patient. Because then there would be an implicit consent on, uh, and a relationship of a doctor and patient. Sure, sir. Sir, one doctor has raised about the uh, where the case will be filed. So if a teleconsultation has been done and the patient is in a different city, and if he wants to file a case in his city and doctor is in another city, so how does uh, that can be sorted out? So this is called territorial jurisdiction. Yes. The sir. law is where cause of action arises. So where cause of action arises in multiple localities or locations, you can actually block multiple locations to say that cause of action where my uh, hospital is because I am imparting or where my sorry 
where my uh, clinic is from where i'm imparting uh, or giving that advice or prescription jurisdiction of only that place would be applicable so you can do that you're entitled to do that under consumer law as well as civil law so another very important and a very interesting uh, question is from uh, dr sebastian he says we do multiple time referral of the patient a diabetologist may refer to a nephrologist so now a virtual conferencing is also possible so does that uh, also get covered a diabetologist calling a nephrologist at the same time and the patient is also in the same call so how about a uh, tele calling of two three parties together probably dr jyoti dev would like to take this because he has already answered this yeah i i i would say that uh, this is something uh, which will be probably covered under the law because uh, uh, the rmb to rmb is allowed and uh, this is rmb and rmb along with the patient yes. so i don't think there will be any problem with this because uh, this is to make sure that uh, the patient is uh, getting consulted from the diabetologist as well as from the uh, nephrologist i saw the uh, because it's a very relevant question because many times when during an in person consultation when the patient is in front of me i will call upon the nephrologist or a cardiologist and will discuss with him on whether i can prescribe this medicine or not so likewise during a video consultation if the patient can have a consultation simultaneously with the two doctors and if it is arranged prior to that i think it is only for the benefit because the telemedicine rules are ultimately for the benefit of the patients and for the benefit of the community so i think this should be okay kanji yeah. has to have the final word on this yeah so another question is uh, there are lots of antidepressants and free psychotics which are prescribed and uh, now in the situation of covid when there is a lockdown and uh, doctors are not available patients are not able to travel although these are restricted drugs should not be prescribed so as an exception case can doctors take an exception because if the patient really needs them and the patient has uh, contacted the doctor what should the doctor say should he refuse that patient or what should be his stand that is what i was telling earlier i will pass on this question of course to kabil ji but before that in the uh, uh, group of medications you remember the group a and group b are there the refill medications are there then add on medications are there so if it's meant for a refill under the group a uh, medications because anti psychotics anti epileptics these are all medications which are there with the patient for a long time so if during this covid crisis they need to fill refill those medications then the doctor can prescribe so i was about to actually go through those uh, amendment amendment of the guidelines so amendment says that there can be frequent modifications in the, the group of these medications which can be prescribed or not and now some of these medications are allowed to be prescribed so there again there is a question to our respectful lawyer and my question is uh, am i audible am yes, i audible sir. now yes yeah. sir you are audible so my question is if if i need to because this is not my patient this is a patient who is getting treated by some other doctor and he is on an anti psychotic and if he is coming to me and uh, if i need to uh, refill his existing medication because any mbbs doctor can refill the existing medication and uh, these are prohibited group of drugs but according to the amendment i can refill the existing medication so how do you know that the patient is on these medication so i will read out the drugs used in psychiatry practice such as phenobarbital clobazam and clonazepam as the first consent and as well as a follow up consent uh, as per the list of medications in the group a so this is the amendment this is dated uh, 11th 11 4 and uh, because there the gray area is as a first consent when i am seeing the patient how do you how do i make sure that the patient is on this because these are all scheduled extracts which i am not supposed to prescribe but according to the amendment i can still prescribe as a first consent if the patients are already on these medications okay abel sir any so my understanding is in such a case a doctor has to apply his best ju uh, judgment under the facts and circumstances so if if at that time the doctor feels that it is an emergency situation and in uh, in person consultation is impossible and medication has to be imparted at that time then he can take that call in terms of the amendment there is 
but even then he will be seeing as you rightly said that these would come under list a and this would only be for refill purposes and only to take care of that emergency situation where a patient is unable to go and for the time that he is unable to go for an in person consultation so it would be for a very very limited purpose of time it would come under emergencies as so described under the guidelines so coming to that emergency question last few questions i think we have overshot on time sir can the patient uh, can the doctor refuse an emergency situation a telephone comes at night 10 o'clock 11 o'clock 12 o'clock and the patient is saying that i am in severe pain or xyz emergency can he refuse a patient at that point in time so before the guidelines there could be legal repercussions from for him to refuse a call these guidelines very categorically say that the doctor can refuse but the reasons of refusal has to be provided for so therefore under these circumstances an advice can be given that uh, the doctor is available between such and such period of time to such and such period of time for teleconsult consultation and that and that he is not available after such and such time okay so it should be that available yes. timing should be mentioned it could but in all circumstances it is the absolute discretion of a doctor not to take a call and even if he is after taken the call if he thinks that he does not want to you know go ahead with the consultation he can by giving valid reason also disconnect or or disengage the call and even if a appointment has been given a doctor can dishonor that appointment he has given an appointment for example 6 o'clock and at 6 o'clock he can dishonor that appointment well the valid reasons has to be given for the same so it could be anything from internet not working to any other valid reason so you have to give a reason because the uh, the relationship or the pre relationship the offer and acceptance for the time at least has already taken place so dr sonita dalal is asking uh, about the comparison of the consultation fees for a physical consultation and a tele consultation they should match it should be less or it should be more is there any guideline or any thoughts on that sir there are no guidelines but as far as finances are concerned i think dr jyoti dev would be he is an old experience hand at this he would be better at explaining this the law doesn't stop you from charging whatever you want to correct i would say that it should be dependent on the type of the consultation the mode of the consultation uh, if it is only a very brief audio consultation then you charge less if it is a video consultation which is going to take Uh, 30 minutes or uh, more then you charge more and uh, depending upon your prescription so i think the uh, consultation for a telemedicine need not be a fixed one and the question on cap it should be something which is appropriate it should be not something like 5000 rupees or 10000 rupees for a brief consultation it should be justifiable because this is for a crisis this is for an emergency yeah. and if somebody is very poor we are also offering lot of free consultations during this time uh, because this is an emergency so many people are starving so if they are calling for an emergency consultation we can even provide uh, of course free of cost so it depends but as uh, kapil ji has said even a free consultation uh, all the legal liabilities will be the same even for the free consultation it is the same the rules are the same so another question is from dr nishit chandra he says after a physical consultation doctor prescribes lot many investigations and what doctor patients are doing nowadays whatsapp all these investigation reports to the doctors and then will say please opine so how legally bound the doctor is to opine on those investigation all the doctor has asked for him to come for a physical visit after investigation but the patient is sending on whatsapp uh, all the investigation so is the doctor bound to respond to such things you see the doctor is not bound to respond as i stated that he can disconnect the relationship at any stage having said that the law stipulates that a patient can insist on an in person consultation which the rmp can not refuse so therefore in a case where the patient is ready and willing to come for an in person consultation and it can be given not during this covid 19 or whatever but The, the circumstances so allow the doctor should not be refusing an in person consultation uh, only to get his numbers higher on teleconference true so another question is from dr ankit goyal so he says if the patient is in india and the doctor practices outside india for example in us 
so is that tele consultation uh, legally allowed for that patient perspective can he tele consult a doctor outside india so the answer is, is is one the doctor registered in india or not that is one so, uh, if it is it not doctor is not so, registered in india so therefore can, can the doctor come to india and prescribe medication to somebody when he is not registered with uh, in the india under indian laws that is your answer secondly the law itself the guidelines say that the patient has to be in india and the doctor also has to be in india when when the relationship uh, starts between the doctor and the patient true very true so both of them should be in the indian uh, uh, boundaries yes yes so i think there have been lots of questions and in the interest of time we may not be able to take we have already overshot the time by half an hour and we were almost viewed by almost 2000 people across the country live so there was a huge response and the questions are pouring like anything so we will have to connect offline to both of you to seek some answers and maybe we will compile a frequently asked question kind of a thing and circulate to answer all these questions so from bottom of my heart i would like to thank uh, both dr jyoti dev sir and uh, advocate kapil sir for this uh, very very informative session and a uh, very very open uh, discussion and very interactive session lots of uh, inputs and lots of feedbacks are also pouring and people have really appreciated it and we at mokard really thank both of you for your time and for your uh, knowledge what you imparted to us today thank you sir thanks a lot thank you pleasure and honor connecting with all of you thank you thank you sir thank you mm -hmm.